so kicking this event off, um, we have four past and present Wallace Stegner Fellows in poetry at Stanford University who will be treating us to poetry readings from their own work. Normally I would edit down the bios, but they are all so fantastic that I'm going to just read all of their achievements and accolades verbatim. <laughs> I'm gonna to try to do it really fast and not make any mistakes on names and titles. Um, first, we have Sam Sachs. Sam is a queer Jewish writer and educator living in Oakland, California. They're the author of Madness, winner of the National Poetry Series, and Bury It, winner of the James Laughlin Award from the Academy of American Poets. They've received fellowships from the National Endowment of the Arts, the Poetry Foundation, and Stanford University. Next will be Paul Tran. Paul is the author of the debut poetry collection, All the Flowers Kneeling, forthcoming from Penguin Poets in 2022. Their work appears in The New Yorker, The Nation, and elsewhere. Paul is a visiting faculty in poetry at Pacific University MFA in writing and a Wallace Stegner Fellow in poetry at Stanford University. Following Paul, we'll have Aria Auber. Aria is based in Oakland as well. Her poem, poems are forthcoming or have appeared in The New Yorker, Poetry Magazine, Kenyon Review, The Poetry Review, and elsewhere. She is the author of Hard Damage, which won the Prairie Schooner Book Prize in Poetry and the Whitting Award. She is currently a Stegner Fellow in Poetry at Stanford University. Finishing the readings will be Hugh Min Nguyen. Hugh is the author of two collections of poetry, Not Here and This Way to the Sugar. His work has appeared in The Atlantic, Hobart, Boat, Best American Poetry, The New York Times, and elsewhere. He, he is a graduate of the MFA program for writers at Warren Wilson College. Originally from the Twin Cities, Hugh now lives in the Bay Area where he serves as a Wallace Stegner Fellow at Stanford University. Thank you, Sam. I'm gonna pass it on to do your reading. Hello. Can y'all hear me? All right, just to double check. My internet's lightweight spotty, so let's ho hopefully I can get my praise and reading in real quick before I cut out. Um, what an absolute pleasure and gift it is to be here to celebrate this monumental achievement in literature, both like uh, narratively, a narrative book from an uh, astounding poet and for the world of writing. Uh, this is going to impact so many young and old readers. Um, and I feel like I'm in a better world now that this book is in it. Um, so thank you so much, Sakia. And I can't wait to uh, continue to read it for years to come and hear you read out of it today. Um, and what a gift it is to be your friend as you're making uh, such monumental and transformative uh, offerings into the, the world of literature and stories. Love you. Um, when deciding what to read, I was like, what would be appropriate for a YA reading? Um, and then I was like, uh, nothing. And then I was thinking, uh, <laughs> I've been sort of like nostalgic for these uh, things I both like didn't like and wasn't good at from before quarantine, you know? Um, and I was thinking about nostalgia as a term that's actually a clinical term for uh, the pain of soldiers returning home uh, after World War I. And we often think of it as, as like ache or heartache for home, but it actually is like a clinical term for being in pain <laughs> for returning home. And so this is a poem about dancing uh, from before, from before, before. And it's called Dance, Dance, Dissolution, Titles in Progress. This memory has me spinning in an abandoned warehouse. A synthetic drum kicks up dust in my chest. I'm wearing some kind of nightmare jacket I sewed together myself from leather scraps. Don't care who sees. The lights are low enough. All of us have been soft blended into nothing, into one body. At last, no desire to feel desirable. And who cares what chemicals I've swallowed and which ones my brain's made itself. The floor and old mouth waiting to open. See, I came here with friends alone to be by myself, to be beside myself, stomping atop lips. The beat you'd have to be dead to miss. Arms lifted into Gothic architectures waiting to be torn apart by the coming war. I kiss a boy just to leave my lip gloss on him. Wear a pair of plastic wings, go ahead and gorge on the dance hall floor. 
This warehouse is in West Oakland, in North Portland, in somewhere in New Jersey. This warehouse in a vacant shopping mall by a sun co beside water. This warehouse is only in the mind where it exists for one night, then disappears into cracked frescoes on cathedral ceilings, onto painted walls of flooded caves. This warehouse comes to me quarantined in my apartment, reading a book by someone dead, written when they were a kid. None of us is to be trusted. I have never been without worry, especially when dancing. My people come from worry, worry my country, worry my wild lung. No, I was never young. Even as a boy, I was an old man straightening papers, which if you insist, is also a form of dancing. Well, thanks, love you, Safia. Safia, I cannot describe how much I love you. I love you so, so much. And it was, it's rather unbelievable to have been in the hotel as your roommate all those years ago when this book was just an idea. And to hold it now in my hands, it's just, you give us no excuse not to chase after our dreams. You give us no excuse not to have the life we want. And I am both so challenged by that and in deep admiration for you. Um, so thank you for letting me celebrate you and this incredible achievement today. Um, the poem I'm going to read is called Judith Slaying Holofernes after the Baroque painting by the same name by the artist Artemisia Gentileschi. She was one of the few women of her time who brought her rapist to trial and publicly um, charged him. Judith slaying Holofernes. I know better than to leave the house without my good dress, my good knife, like a crucifix between my stone breasts. My mother would have me whipped for that. She'd have me kneel on rice until I shrilled so loud I rang the church bells. Didn't I tell you she'd remind me that elegance is our revenge? That there are neither victims nor victors, but the bitch we envy in the end. I am that bitch. I am dogged. I am so damn not even death wanted me. He set me back after you sacked my body the way your army sacked my village stacked our headless idols in the same river where our children impaled themselves on rocks. I exit night. I enter your tent gilded in this bolt of stubborn sunlight. My sleeves already rolled up and I know what they'll say. She's a slut for showing this much skin this irreverence for what is seen when I ask to be seen. Look at me. My thigh lifts from your thigh. My mouth spits poison into your mouth. You nasty beauty, I'm no beast. But when my blade slides clean through your thick neck, while my maid keeps your blood off me and my good dress, it will be a song the parish sings for centuries. Tell Mary, tell Eve, tell Salome and David about me and watch all their faces like yours turn green. I love you, Safia. Um, Safia, thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this. I feel so blessed to know you and to start this friendship and writing journey with you. Um, I feel like I scamped my way into this virtual stage with all of these amazing stars. Um, your book is incredible. I'm just like so in love with the way you write and your singular vision and your voice, which is so original and heartfelt and tender. And um, I'll be reading the first poem from my book, um, which I know you like. So this is obviously for you. Reading Rilke in Berlin. Into English, I splintered the way my father clutched his valise at the airport, defeated and un-American. It took me 12 strange springs to know nothing occurs out of a sudden. How do I let it go? Little has been purloined from me and the ghosts of childhood still sibilate, by which I mean nobody has touched me on my innermost parts. 
At the accent reduction class, my teacher instructed me to invert my tongue like in love. So I lay at a pavement, under your elegy, in a bridge. Such starkness, the want to put inside me a perfect sentence. What would have Lou Salome done? I absolved every year around the sun, knowing that there is an animal smell hooked to a line leading past a border I am not going to cross. But what is exile exactly? What exactitude? Father says hour for hour, allo for hello. Father says, is good, don't come back, eat fruit, green card. If I could explain to him the difference between exist and exit, maybe others too will hear the law in a law. When they asked my mother, where are you from? She smiled and replied, fine, how are you? Oh, I shoved my hand right through the officer's mouth and ripped out his tongue. Then under my pillow, I placed it and waited for it to bloom new my blood. Thank you. Safia, it's the day. Happy birthday. Um, I love you so much. And being your friend is one of the biggest blessings of my life. Um, I mean, I can keep on going, but I am going to, uh, read a poem that I picked because of how, actually, first of all, I remember asking you about the book and, and, uh, you telling me the story. And then I, then when you finished, you know, your, your little brief description, I was like, well, go on. And then you told me more about the story. And then it felt as if a bunch of people started gathering and then you kind of just like gave a whole story to like you, you told us the entire story of the book and we looked we looked around and suddenly it was dark out and I, I remember that moment and um and I miss being in a room with you and miss being near your energy and so I chose this poem um yeah because I miss you attending the party to justify another month of solitude, I tell, my, I tell myself, despite my instinct to stay inside, it'll be good to exhaust myself of the world. Outside the yellow house on Portland Avenue, I kick the slush from my boots, ascending the empty porch. Even if I'm wrong, and the light beyond the door is a light to nowhere, I can still say I tried, at least for a moment, to live outside the warm parameters of my loneliness. I can't stop thinking of the old man who'd salt and shovel his walk clean and precise every morning and how the neighbors growing suspicious of the jagged terrain of his, of his driveway discovered weeks later he'd pass away in his sleep. But here is a world where the people I love gather in small rooms with not enough chairs how lucky I am to be missed by those who have run out of ways to hold me. And isn't that what I always wanted? To keep something perfect long enough for everyone to notice when I'm gone. Thank you so much, Safia. And I love you so much. Wow, that was lovely. Um, what a way to, um you know, introduce you, Safia, to have all your friends come um, and congratulate you and celebrate you and read their poems for you in your honor. Um, so thank you, everybody. That was lovely. Um, we're going to switch gears a little bit um, and we're going to bring uh, Christopher on. Um, hi, Christopher. Um, now, it is my pleasure Hello. to welcome the person we are all here to celebrate today, Safia El Hilo. Safia is the author of The January Children, which received the Silurman First Book Prize for African Poets and an Arab American Book Award and Girls That Never Die for forthcoming, uh, forthcoming from One World Random House in 2021. 
Sudanese by way of Washington, D.C. She holds an MFA from the New School, a Cave Canham Fellowship, and a 2018 Ruth Lilly and Dorothy Sargent Rosenberg Fellowship from the Poetry Foundation. Safia is a Pushcart Prize nominee, co-winner of the 2015 Brunel International African Poetry Prize, and listed in Forbes Africa's 2018 30 Under 30. Safia's work appears in Poetry Magazine, Callaloo, and the Academy of American Poets Poem a Day series, among others, and in anthologies including The Breakfast Poets, New American Poetry in the Age of Hip Hop, oh, sorry, The Breakbeat of Breakfast, Breakbeat Poets, New American Poetry in the Age of Hip Hop, and The Penguin Book of Migration Literature. Her work has been translated into several languages and commissioned by Under Armour, uh, Kayana, Suyana, and the Barbarian State Ballet. With uh, Fatima Ashkar, she is co-editor of the anthology Halal, If You Hear Me, um, and you guessed it, she is currently a Wallace Stegner Fellow at Stanford University and lives in Oakland. And tonight, of course, we get to add and celebrate that she is the author of the YA debut novel, In Verse, Home is Not a Country. Congratulations, Safia. Joining Safia in conversation is Christopher Myers, Christopher is a multimedia artist, essayist, and writer who is widely acclaimed for his work with literature for young people. Christopher is the creative director of Make New Worlds, an imprint of Random House Children's books committed to publishing stories for children that reflect our diverse world, and his work includes collaborations with artisans around the globe and mentorship of a burgeoning new generation of creators. Christopher's writing and artwork are garnered has garnered him several awards, including a Caldecott honor, several, several Coretta Scott King honors, and a Boston Globe honor. His celebrated picture book, My Pen, brings a sketchbook to life, and his forthcoming works include Cartography, a play written with Keniza Shaw, sorry if I mispronounced that, um, and Know What You Know, a dialogue between father and son, a conversation with his father, Walter Dean Myers. Whoa, <laughs> lots of... Um, Great people here to help you celebrate, Safia. You're added to the mix. Um, we're so excited. Um, so I'll pass it on to Christopher and Safia for their conversation. And for our attendees, make sure you're asking questions in the Q&A box for me to ask on your behalf later. Thank you, everybody, and congratulations, Safia. What's up, y'all? How you doing? What's going on, Safia? How you feeling? Hi. Um, it's been a this all feels very surreal. I'm like sitting in my empty living room looking at all of your festive faces on my little screen, but um, it still feels so celebratory. So thank you also for everyone who read. Um, it truly is a miracle and a fluke that I'm not like in tears right now. Um, I love you all so much and thank you. Uh, it, this feels so much like um... So, some kind of like larger life celebration, you know, in, in so many ways. And it reminds me of the idea that like large life celebrations are usually about transitions, right? They're usually about moving from one kind of life to another. And I think that's super appropriate for this book, which sort of lives like a lot of your friends, the, the authors that have read, they, it lives in different worlds. It lives in that, that moment of transition between spaces. Um, why do you think that you're particularly attracted to both that as a theme and people who are living that as a theme? Um, I mean, my uh, third space countryman. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think, um, I mean, it's just like you said, I, I think I've like spent my whole life um, feeling in between worlds, surrounded by people who are in between worlds and who we all of us kind of just like set up shop in that in between space and decided that that's where we live and that's where we're from um, and that's who we are. And I think I just like, there is no people that I feel like I understand more than people who like, whose world ended in some way and they, uh, built a new one from scratch with in like approximations of the language and the culture and the customs of the space that was left behind. Um, and that's not always necessarily about just immigration, but just all sorts of like worlds re-beginning for people. Um, 
And I feel like in writing YA, what like truly what is adolescence if not being in this weird in-between world? Um, yeah. Not a child anymore, you're not grown up yet, but it's something, it's, it's that third space. So it's, um, I don't know, is adolescence the diaspora of life stages? <laughs> Um, I'm going to put that on a t-shirt, uh, <laughs> adolescence, the diaspora of life stages. You know, it's, there are things that people identify you as being sort of in between worlds, right? So people are like, oh, you're Sudanese American. And everyone imagines that you like live on that hyphen in between. Um, what are some of the other in-betweens? I noticed like with some of your friends, like, okay, so like Sam's got the Bartleby shirt on. Um, because Melville is somehow also like a ghost of um, of, an, of, of in between world people, and definitely Bartleby is. Um, or we talk about like Artemisia Gentileschi and like that court case, which is much more insane than even Paul like said. Like if, if there's like her father's involved and her father's friends and it's just super odd. So I feel like there's more to this in-betweenness than just our, our kind of nations. What are some of the in-betweens that you represent? Like if you if you had to like, if you were a gang, if what would be like the some of the, the kind of patron symbols of your gang? So like what I know is like you dress fiercely like you don't dress you dress like you're not taking prisoners <laughs> what are some of the other ones that 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 you that you represent for um i and i think a couple of people that we heard from as well were um hugh paul and sam and i all met doing slam um hugh and i met doing youth poetry slam and then i met paul and sam in college um and then met Arya a little bit later on, but I think the the binary that people have been trying to push my whole poetry writing life is that between page and stage, like they truly are such different worlds and everyone needs to pick a lane and stay there. Um, but the poets in my community, the poets that I learn from the most and that I love the most and that I spend the most time learning from have been like collapsing that binary since the beginning of time. You know, the, the poem has to be doing something or other on the page to justify the time you take sitting with it and reading it on the page. And also if you wanna, you know, especially in the before times where you get to leave your house to go hear someone read poetry, I think it is a sign of respect to make it like worth people's while to come and hear you read the poems out loud instead of just sitting in their quiet, comfortable houses, reading them quietly to themselves on the page. Um, but to me, it is always the same poem. And to a lot of these poets in these communities that we grew up with, it was the same poem. Um, so we, I don't know what I would call that third space, uh, but you know, neither page nor stage, but both, I guess, is uh, another one of our third spaces. Um, I'm trying to think what else. Um, I don't know, but I, I do like that you just invited me to start a gang in front of all these people. <laughs> I mean, I mean, this is this is all about uh, warfare. That's what I, I see what we're doing. It's gang, it's gang life, gang, gang all the time. Um, you know, I, I another thing that I heard in some of the community that you have kind of gathered around you um, is all of these kind of different interpretations. There's There's like a longing at the center of this book you know, and um, I, I was thinking about like, you know, these German words and like, you know, Portuguese and like, so, there's like saudade, there's fernve, like this idea of like, that you can have a longing for a place that you haven't really been um, or a time that you haven't really been. And I think that all of that is sort of like braided into home is not a country. This, all of the kinds of longing, like it, it it's, it's like, we as human beings seem to create words to build around that longing, right? So you're like Seinsuk, Fernve, Saudaji, um, nostalgia itself. Um, first of all, do you have any words that you want us to learn that deal with either longing or anything? Like, is there, are there words that you feel like would really help us to understand and feel where you're coming from? Are there words that you feel like if you don't get that word, then you don't get this get this thing. Um, you know, for me, like it would be like 
talking about? <laughs> you know, which is like, what you talking about? But like, what, what are some words for you that you feel like are kind of essential to this project? Um, well, first of all, before Sam's reading today, I did not know the origins of the word nostalgia, and it really opens it up for me in so many new ways where it like, it's not about wanting to go home, it's about being sad that you are home. And I think that's still a, a, like an element of it that would still make sense for home is not a country because it like, I think what Nerma and by extension myself have a hard time accepting is that we live here. You know, um, so by the definite, like, where do I pay rent and taxes? Here. Um, and so it's not that I don't know, like, where where my roof is. It's, it's, I think, the fact that where my roof is and where, like, my heart is are not in alignment. Um, and that's, I think, in the element of nostalgia that really makes the most sense for me because it actually has nothing to do with geography. I go to Sudan all the time. It like, I have like a normal relationship to Sudan. It's not that, it's not about like nationality or geopolitics in that way. It's about something, um, the whole point of it is that it can never exist for me. Right, right. I, I, I love that. I, in on, on the theme of Sudan, there's an old video that, <laughs> that I was just thinking about Khartoum and how much that that place I I do not go all the time I was there once um in 2010 for I, I was there for about a year in one month Are you in a lecture <laughs> in this video yes um, <laughs> and 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 there's something about a, a place that that I feel like uh that lives in so much of the world's imagination, but doesn't any live in a real way. Like people talk about Sudan all the time, and that and this is not what they're seeing when they say Sudan, even though this is so Sudani, you know. Um, and and I, and I love the opportunity, the the gift that you give people to kind of see the 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 realness of a place through your eyes, and also the way in which a place is made as much of dreaming as it is of kind of concrete things. Um, and I, I really love that. Um, I just wanted to say, like, I, I wanted to invite you to read something. And, and I know we didn't plan this, so if you need a moment. But I, I wanted to invite you to read the Girlfriend of Abdul Halim poem. If you have it, I, it might be right behind you. And while you look for it, I'll just say, so, you know, early on when I, when I, when I thought about this imprint, I uh, thought about people that I thought I wanted to speak to young people, people who I thought had a special voice to give to young people, I thought of this poem. Um, and this poem was one of the poems that I, I showed people at the, the, at, the, at the company to say, hey, this is the kind of voice that young people need to be hearing. Um, and so I was, I was super, super happy when Sophia chose to publish this with us. Um, that after, after some conversations of being like, Sophia, you should write a book for young people. And Sophia was like, I write poems. And then I was like, young people read poems. And then it was like, but there needs to be like a whole book. I was like, write a lot of poems. Um, and I'm just really, really, really happy that this is um, something that is, is in the world as, um, again, it, it's, it's, uh, as Sam said, uh, it's it's a better world now that this book is in it, and I think that that is so much uh, what my goal is as a, as as a as a creative director of an imprint, and it's so much of what everyone's goal that you have heard tonight is is that you know these books are necessary, poems are necessary, literature is necessary, and we sincerely believe that putting this work out into the world makes it a better world now that this work is in it. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm so excited to listen to and to hear this kind of first nugget, this moment that I thought, wow, this would be a great thing for every teen in the world to see. Thank you. Also, this is, I know people are going to think I'm exaggerating, but there would, this novel would not exist if it were not for you, because in case you remember, I tried to get out of writing it so much. I was like, oh, mm -hmm. um, thank you so much, sir. Uh, I- um, Thank you. <laughs> thank you, sis. Um, but 
Yeah, I, I was like, I'm not a narrative writer. I've never thought about it in my life. I uh, am a creature who deeply intends to stay in my own lane for all eternity. Um, and um, you you really, you talked to me out of my lane. I don't know what else to say. I'm so grateful to you. And it turns out there's far outside the lane anyway. It's still homes. Um, and there's a bunch of young people in the world who will be thanking you for generations. I hope so. I just hope they read it. Um, this is, so I think this is the poem you're talking about. There's a series of poems in the January Children where I am uh, applying and then interviewing to be uh, Abdel Halim Hafiz's girlfriend. Abdel Halim Hafiz is a, um, the late uh, great Egyptian pop star and cinema icon. Um, you can't see it, but my whole apartment is like full of Abdel Halim paraphernalia. Um, but it would like disrupt my delicate setup to show you all. But this is the first one in the series and it's called Application for the Position of Abdel Halim Hafiz's Girl. I go quiet for days. I turn the color of mirrors. I turn the color of smoke. Men tell me sometimes that blue becomes me. When I answer, my voice is hoarse from disuse. I am afraid of my body and the ways that it fails me. I faint. A woman on the subway platform catches me floating into the tracks. I become the color blue. I don't like to be touched. I wonder why more people have not been kidnapped by taxi drivers. White men ask me to say their names in Arabic. Ask me where I'm really from. I'm six months returned from Sudan. Henna fading to look like burns dusted up my arms. I bleed and can't stop bleeding. I speak and my mouth is my biggest wound. Every language is a borrowed joke. I catch myself complimenting strangers on their English. I'm six months returned from incense smoke to soften the taste of river water. Incense burns to avert the evil eye. I see a possessed woman scream when a prayer is read, her eyes the color of smoke, and mine is a story older than water. I guess that's what we, what we do, or we snap, or I'm old, <laughs> perhaps. Um, I'm wondering if, if, if maybe there are some questions or some thoughts, or is, is this a good time to switch to that? Hmm. Um, I was going <laughs> to just send you a message and say you've got five minutes over. Um, but yeah, make sure if you have any questions to get them in the Q&A box so I can read them for you. We do have a couple there. Um, I will start off with Winston, um, who asked, um, what is your favorite part of the Bay? Um, and Safia, this question is for you and all of the readers. Um, so if anyone um, who was part of the um, earlier read wants to come on and answer this question, you're welcome to do so. But I will put it to Safia. Yeah. Um, I'm sure at this point I would have more favorite places in the Bay because it will be two years in August since I moved here. But six months after I moved here, we all stopped being able to go outside. So um, my world is small here, but um, I feel uh, like a great belonging and uh, community in around Fruitvale, uh, which is where I first started going there because I just Googled eyebrow threading near me um, and started going to the eyebrow queen there on International Boulevard. And it just is any like place in this country that feels like Queens is where I want to be. And it, you know, it's, I'm sure it is dead wrong for me to use uh, East Coast metrics to talk about California, but it like feels to me the way being in, like being on Steinway in Queens feels. Um, and I, had not been in almost a year. It had been almost a year since I last got my eyebrows done. And uh, the other day I was like, okay, the book is coming out. I'm going to be showing my face to the camera. Um, my eyebrows and my baby hair are the same growth of hair. So I need someone periodically to separate them. Um, so I went back, unfortunately my usual eyebrow lady was not there but they're all good in that space. And then I just walked around afterwards and it like is still so vibrant and feels like one of those third spaces that we're talking about where I'm like hearing a billion different languages and rarely is one of them English. Um, and I just feel like very at peace and in context in spaces like that. Thank you. Um, let me see, we have some fun and interesting questions here in the Q&A box. Uh, Fatima wants to know um, your outfit breakdown, please. We'll start with the 
that fun ones. <laughs> um, so these are from Sudan, from a, a spot not far from the video that uh, Chris was playing in the background. These are um, like bootleg imitations of traditional Sudani wedding jewelry, but these are fake and from Sugum Durman. Um, what else? My brother got me this little ear cuff for my birthday. It has a twin, but since you can't see this other ear, I just didn't put it on. Um, this dress, hold on. I might actually, I might stand. I'm gonna, I'm, Do it. Never stood during a Zoom reading before, but I guess it's my party. Um, exactly. Okay, so this is beautiful. A dress from um, an Etsy shop that I like very much, um, which is based in Greece. Um, they're called Eating the Goober. And what I love about this dress, I don't know if you can see, is all these pieces are detachable. So this comes off and then down here is this little strap. I could wear it like that. These long sleeves come off. Um, it does all sorts of cool stuff. Um, I bought it specifically for this launch event um, and it has been hanging in my closet since then. I keep like almost coming up with excuses to wear it. I'm like, I'm having a bad day. I wanna wear my new dress, but I uh, managed to keep it unworn until today. Um, so thank you all for uh, hanging out with this dress with me today. It was a perfect day to wear it. <laughs> well done. Um, all right, now we've got some questions about writing. So we're gonna switch to that side of things. Um, let's see from Brian. Um, Safia, thank you so much for your gorgeous words. You've written a wonderful book of poetry in the January children, blended page and stage and other pieces. And now you have incorporated lyric and narrative in your new book. I'm curious, what poems are you learning how to write now? This is the question I've been dying to be asked because I, um, my poems are going through puberty right now. It really, it, I don't know how else to explain it, but I'm, um, a few of us right now, Hugh and Paul and Aria, um, are in workshop with the poet Louise Glick at the moment. Um, and she is ripping me apart, but it is amazing. I, I feel myself like flourishing under this, I don't know if I can call it tough love, I don't know if she loves me, but uh, she is <laughs> definitely a very rigorous and attentive teacher. Um, and I cannot get away with any of my old tricks before anymore. So it is making me really, kind of re-examine all of my mannerisms and ask myself why I started doing like certain stylistic gestures in the first place. I also, maybe related, maybe separate. She also is, um, she likes a very uh, tangible poem. So this might just me, be me like writing poems to pander to her in workshops so she's not mean to me. But um, I'm for the first time in my life interested in a more narrative sort of poem. And it probably is like the aftershocks of writing this novel because um, it really was just such a relief to sit down and already know what I was going to be writing about, which is what happened in making this novel. But I'm like thinking about, I was reading a Richard Sykin interview and he, he was talking about how in his first book, um, he was thinking about cinema as kind of the, the second form for the poems and in his second book, uh, he was thinking about painting as that second form. And I think I am now in the cinema space where I'm trying to write poems that feel like movies. I'm trying to write poems that have plot for the first time, which used to be like a dirty word for me. Um, but I'm trying to write poems that have plot, that have event. Um, I'm sitting in memory in a new way where I used to kind of just like bring memory up in passing, but kind of more like beads on a necklace than in like sitting in the full story of a memory for the duration of a poem. And now I'm trying to sit in, like to make a story out of the memory and sit in it for the duration of the poem. Um, but because I'm still a relatively new narrative writer, my sense of cause and effect is all fucked up. So I have to like, um, I will like jump and then be like, well, I get why this caused this, but there's like four steps missing in between. And that's usually, uh, it is usually the workshop space that will be, it's always my third stanza, which is where they know that I'm like not saying what I really mean. Um, but yeah, my poems are deeply like, yeah, in going through puberty right now. 
That's a great answer. And there's um, some questions here that that can lead into. It's just, which one do I pick first? Um, I guess I'll go with Ellis's question. Um, they want to know, can you share a bit about your revision process for a home is not a country? Talking about going <laughs> through puberty and having to revise, revise your work. Um, revising this book was hard. It is not, it was not like revising poetry in ways that I'm used to. Um, the first draft got written relatively quickly. I like sat down and I had kind of a like daily word count goal or whatever. So I cranked out a first draft pretty quickly, but it was like primarily hot nonsense. Um, and before I even ever sent it to Michelle, I was workshopping it with my friends, Liz and Clint, who are in a sort of unofficial writing group together. Um, and they were both very helpful. Liz also writes fiction. Um, Clint writes nonfiction, but I think he just has like a really good head for structure and for making sense uh, because he is an essayist. Um, and so it went through like kind of more generative revisions with them where they were like, what if you added a part where this happened? Um, my partner, Chris Nunez is also a narrative writer and he was the one who kind of from the, like at the very beginning made me a sort of syllabus to write towards based on uh, how he was explaining the hero's journey to me, which I had not studied it. I was like thinking that I was gonna like learn all this theory and history before I ever wrote a single word. But he was like, let me just tell you what happens in the hero's journey and then you can go back to writing. Um, but then when I got my first rounds of notes from Michelle, a lot of them had to do with story, which is not like even a, a generative muscle that I had spent very much time using, um, where she would be like, what if something else happened here? And I'd be like, what do you mean something else? This is all, I, this is all I've got. Um, and so the conversation that we would have a lot during that revision process is, um, she brought this up earlier today where I remember telling her that um, I like, only know how to make individual bricks. I don't know how to make the full house and the house, I guess, being narrative or even just event on that smaller scale. Um, so I would be like, if you like, tell me specifically what to do, I will do it. But you cannot give me an open-ended prompt like this because I will spiral. I don't, I literally don't know what you're asking me to do. Um, and she was very patient with me and very generous with me. And we got through quite a few rounds of edits this way. Um, I think the, the bones of the book are the same. I think it, or the beginning of the book is the same. There's like a big chunk, 75% of the way in that just got completely ripped out and replaced with something else. And that process of trying to refill this gaping hole I'd made in my manuscript was maybe the most stressed out I've ever been in my life. Little note, who are Liz and Clint? And Michelle, Michelle is an editor that works with us at Make Me a World, who, without whom it all would not be happening. We really appreciate Michelle. Who are Liz and Clint? Uh, Liz and Clint are Elizabeth Acevedo and Clint Smith III. That for the young adult people out there, they're very excited about that. And then Clint Smith is also a dope writer. Um, so check, check him out. <laughs> yeah, we hosted um, Elizabeth. Uh, pre-COVID and um, got to see her in person. It's amazing. So hopefully we can have you all in person one day in our stores soon. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> we have another, let's see. Oh, two good questions. Let me ask you this one. And Christopher, you might be able to add some to this as well. Um, this is from, from um, excuse me if I mispronounce your name, um, Angelica. Uh, what is your advice for poets who want to be novelists? Um, my advice? Yes, Safia, we'll go with you. Um, <laughs> Chris called you out. <laughs> um, they are not as separate as I once believed them to be. I'm out here talking about, I don't believe in the binary between page and stage. But then as soon as someone started talking to me about genre, I all of a sudden became like orthodox about genre. Um, it's the, the boundaries between genres are arbitrary and made up. They're not so different. Um, it just is like writing poems, but for a longer time. It's like you're writing a really long book of poems. Um, and I think the main difference in writing narrative for me than writing non-narrative poems 
is that I felt a little more beholden to, like I was saying before, cause and effect. I think it, it matters a little bit more in a novel where in a poem that is not presented in narrative context, the logic is kind of yours to make as you wish. Um, I can be like, I, I slammed the door because the sky was blue and you can be like, yeah, totally. Um, in fiction or in narrative in general, I think it kind of, you're a little more responsible, I think for paving the way to the uh, effect from the cause. So that's something I think that that muscle takes a little more working out, but it like, it's still building sentences, you know, you just don't necessarily always have to break the line. Um, I just want to add to this that that thing that Safia talked about, about it's hilarious. We talked about hybridity, we talk about liminal spaces, we talk about I'm neither here nor there. I'm all up and down and sometimes I'm Thursday, but other times I'm daffodils. And then all of a sudden you're like, what about a novel? I cannot do a novel. Novels is not what I do. I don't do novels. I'm a poet, damn it, poets. <laughs> it's, it's, I'll tell you what I believe sincerely with all my heart. Poets are like people who are really good at uh, like having a knife fight in a phone booth. Right. These are some people who are tight with words. They, they, their, their words are going very, 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 um, you know, close to the vest. There's an intimacy with language. That intimacy, that love of language, extends to any other genre. Real talk. Poets probably are like the thoroughbreds of writers, and then everybody else is just trying to figure it out. Um, and in that, I also just want to say to anyone out there who is thinking about how to kind of break genre or how to, whether or not they have the right to call themselves a novelist, a poet, a whatever thing, that's all a kind of a structure and a hierarchy that somebody else put on us. You don't hear, like, the, like you know, there's, there's an old phrase that I sort of love about Lord, give me the confidence of a mediocre white dude. And that is the truth. Like you see, you know, it, go, go into any, uh, go to a bar, go to a bar with a bunch of mediocre dudes in it, mediocre dudes of any color, really. And then ask a question that takes some authority. Those dudes will say an answer. They will give you some kind of answer because they never question whether or not they have the right to give an answer, the right to believe in themselves. And, and, and real talk, you have the right to do this. You, you have a story to tell, whoever the heck you are. Yeah, it's gonna be a lot of work. You're, you may or may not be able to put as much work into it as Safia put into Home Is Not A Country. I saw every draft, <laughs> that's a lot of work. But the point is that, you know, there is nothing, the, the thing that should stop you is that you find out that you are in fact a lazy person. It, what should not stop you is the thing that you realize that you don't think that you deserve to call yourself a poet or a novelist or a storyteller or anything of that sort. Real talk, that's that's my only advice for poets that want to be novelists. It's really my, my advice for anybody who has a story to tell. Perfect. Um, and that kind of, I it kind of answers our next question, but I want to ask it uh, all the same for Miriam. Um, at what point does one call themselves a poet? Is it when you get published or perhaps when you feel like you've written a good enough poem? And congrats on the book, Safia. So. Thank you. Um, I think if you have written a poem or intend to write a poem, that's enough for me for you to be out here calling yourself a poet. It's a very unregulated term. You can really, if you wanna be a poet, if you wanna call yourself a poet, by all means do. Don't think oh, someone is gonna like jump out and be like, no, you're not. That person- okay, You're not the poetry police? <laughs> That's, I've been waiting for that person to show up my whole life and they're still not here. So I think maybe they don't exist. Very well said, very well said. Well, um, we have room, uh, time for one more question. So I saved this one. This is from Joyce. Um, Joyce wonders, Safia, do you feel closer to the world or any worlds after you've written them some, written something, or does that feeling change at all when it is sent out to the world for others to read? Um, I feel 
the most in the world when I'm writing. I think part of the reason for these first few months of the pandemic, I didn't write at all is because at first I thought it was gonna take like two seconds and we were gonna be out of here. And I was like, I do not wanna make a record of this time. This sucks. Um, but once I got beyond that, I think it, I like require of myself radical presence when I am writing, when I'm making a poem, I need to really be in my body and in my sensations and in my observations and in my memories. Um, and those first few months, it was like, we were all traumatized. I just wanted to be distracted. I wanted to watch reality television and read fashion magazines. I did not want to write any goddamn poetry. Um, but I think it it is because it like, it kind of is like being like a newborn baby or like an exposed nerve where everything like has to happen at full volume. Um, and sometimes I do not have the bandwidth for that volume, such as, uh, this once in a lifetime, well, in my lifetime so far, pandemic. Um, but I think it like, I feel very in the world when I'm writing because I feel very in my body when I'm writing, um, which is not necessarily the case when I'm not writing. I think I um, spend a lot of time uh, trying and succeeding to distract myself. Um, and that is also a way of like coping and moving through the day. But it does when it's time to write, I have to be willing to cast that off and just be like the raw nerve and endure it. Um, and then after it's done, I can go like get in the bathtub and listen to a podcast or whatever. So that's a great answer. Um, I We did get one more question. That was a really good question. We have time for it. So I'm gonna ask it. This is from uh, Christina. Uh, where did you place yourself in your character, Nima? Where do the comparisons stop, or did you write? Did you um, did you write with yourself in mind? Um, so Nirma is almost entirely fictional. With the the things that I have lent to that character is that I too was almost named Yasmin, uh, and then my dad's like great aunt Safia died, and they were like we should we should name the baby Safia. That would be the respectful thing to do. Um, Safia is also not like a, a like trendy, cool young person's name in Sudan. It, it is like kind of out of fashion, dustier name. Um, so I think that I my whole life have like known that I almost had this other name and didn't get it. And I think it like has been a way of thinking of the fact that I also like almost had this whole other life and didn't get it. So that was kind of the the catalyst for this whole story was based in that autobiographical truth. Um, I also went to Sudani Sunday school uh, where we had a bunch of parent volunteers teach us Arabic. Um, they would also try and teach us more like nebulous things about culture. They like for years tried to teach us the Sudanese national anthem. I still only know like the first two bars of it. It just didn't take. Um, but that also is like a real place, the, uh, the Bigala, which is the uh, what Nirma and Haytham call ethnic Walmart in the book is based on uh, Al Khartoum grocery in Adams Morgan in Washington DC, um, which is uh, where me and my family, I mean, I guess before I moved here, uh, used to go to get all of our various Sudanese groceries. And also it's just one of those places, a bigala, I don't even know how to like describe it, but I guess it is kind of a smaller scale of a thing like a Target or a Walmart like there's groceries, there's like a full butcher counter in the back, but also you can buy like furniture and tapes and uh, like hookah stuff and jewelry. Um, so it just is like a your one-stop shop to furnish and feed and, and clothe your home. Um, so that is based on a real place. But I think the reason that I did not name any of the places in the book is that I wanted permission to imagine into like on top of the reality of the places without being beholden to representing them accurately and without also like holding myself to to the responsibility to, to represent those places accurately because if you know the unnamed homeland sure is like based heavily on Sudan but Sudan is not historically a place that gets a whole lot of representation in American letters 
So I did not want to be out here responsible for like rendering the Sudan accurately so that a reader afterwards could be like, now having read this book, I like know what the deal is with Sudan. I did not want to give someone that easy way out. So the country in the book doesn't have a name. Um, and you know, if one wants to learn about Sudan, good luck. I wish you the best in your, in your Googling endeavors. You're not going to get it from this book. Um, but it also, I like planted a bunch of Easter eggs in there for Sudani people or for people who are familiar with Sudani culture to be like, this is probably Sudan because they're going to the Bigala, they're listening to Gisma and Muhammad Wardi and she's dancing the Regaba. So obviously where else is it going to be, you know? Perfect. Well, thank you. That was our last question. Um, if any of the uh, poets from in earlier in the event want to join back in to say goodbye. Um, and again, congratulate Safia on um, Home is Not a Country being out and in shelves or on shelves and in bookstores today. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for everyone who joined us, for all of our attendees, for all of our, our creators, our poets here um, to help us celebrate Safia. Um, just a reminder, if you haven't purchased your book already, we do have signed copies available at BookThink, and I will be sending out a special coupon code, it's just SAFIA, that you can use at the uh, point of sale um, on our website to get that signed copy. Um, and again, thank you, thank you so much for everyone. I hope you have a wonderful night and happy book birthday, SAFIA. Um, thank you, everyone. Have a lovely night. Bye now. Thank you.